Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about FIDIC. I think I'm sort of setting the scene, really, to give everyone a sense, um, to the extent you don't already have a sense, of some of the challenges that we're facing um, in terms of using the, the, the main type of contract that we're using at, at the moment. Um, just a, a wee bit of background about me. I'm Marianne Roth. I'm the VP Legal at Seaway 7. I've now been VP Legal at Seaway 7 for all of six months. So I, I come from um, a private practice background and I've been hugely privileged to be able to make that step into in-house. But I mention that only because I guess I have a background which has seen an awful lot of disputes around FIDIC and also seen kind of the areas where it's useful and the areas where maybe it's less useful. Um, for those of you just who are not aware, a wee bit of background on FIDIC, it might be worth remembering that the acronym stands for, French accent coming up, Fédération Internationale des Ingénieurs Conseils. So it, it, it comes from a consulting engineer's background and, and that gives you a sense of it's used for infrastructure projects on land and that's the concept in which it, it's been developed. And we'll see a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, but rather beautifully, it's known as the Rainbow Suite, as I'm sure you'll know, because it comes in a panoply of different colours. Um, the ones that we mostly come across in our sector are the red, the yellow and the silver. Um, the red being a situation where the contractor is not um, doing any design work. So it's building engineering works designed by the employer. Um, the yellow book is where it's construction and engineering works designed by the contractor generally and then silver book is the full kind of EPC scary situation. So those are the ones that we, we normally see or versions thereof and again I'm going to say a wee bit more about that in a moment. Um, FIDIC has this concept of the golden principles which again sounds rather lovely. We've got rainbow suite and we've got golden principles. Um, and they're up on the slide there. Uh, and the intention, uh, sort of FIDIC says, you're allowed to amend their contracts, but you're not allowed to do anything that would uh, adjust the balance of the golden principles, which sounds wonderful. <laughs> uh, but again, a lot of people in this room may feel that that is not what happens in practice. And, and actually, if you look carefully at the golden principles themselves, you might wonder whether... Um, you, you know, for example, the third one is that the risk reward allocation must not change because FIDIC already has a very fair allocation of risk and reward. Now, you know, one might query that. So, so I think the, the, there's already perhaps a, a, a challenge there in terms of that. And, and I just a wee shout out here to, to what IMCA is, is doing here. I was um, uh, flattering Ian earlier and, and James, who I think was responsible for this, for the, the wonderful at a glance document that sets out um, IMCA's renewables principles and the kind of four objectives that underline that. And I actually think those four objectives are a really good place. That They're kind of doing the same sort of thing that the five golden principles are, but they're trying to sort of step back, look from a real project angle at what we're all trying to achieve and work out what the four kind of key objectives are. So, you know, starting with those in our minds, I think is a really helpful place to start. Just get off my soapbox there for a minute, sorry, back onto the FIDIC topic. Um, so, as I said, they're designed for use primarily for onshore um, civil engineering construction projects. And so what that means is that even as a starting point, the FIDIC standard forms don't cater for stuff that, uh, you know, on any basis we have to cover when we're doing works offshore. So, you know, uh, use of vessels, um, how do you deal with weather, um, you know, soil conditions, Ian mentioned, obviously they are dealt with, but not really in a way that's appropriate for offshore. Um, there's no knock for knock, which is kind of sounds crazy for anyone who works normally offshore, but it's completely normal for people who, who only deal with onshore construction projects. So, so even if the parties are completely aligned on what they're trying to achieve in terms of the risk reward balance, you're already introducing risk into the contract because you kind of have to amend it to introduce those, those elements. Um, and that is likely to, to both to affect the risk reward balance, but also to, you know, when you look at the size and scale of a FIDIC contract, it's quite difficult to, to, to uh, um, you know, to amend all the relevant bits right the way through the contract that need to be amended once you've changed a view on a particular principle. So you're already adding a wee bit of risk in there. 
so, so I think the other challenge that, that we find as well in the industry is that we often start from the wrong contract. So we're talking here about a transport and installation um, contract that's been, that's been put together by IMCA. Quite often as contractors, I think we feel that we are doing a transport and installation scope, but we're presented with a contract which, is, which includes design. Um, so you're, you know, you're starting off by stroking out, striking out all the bits that relate to design before you even get, get started. So I think that's another issue that um, is a challenge when you're starting from a FIDIC um, starting point. Um, other things, and this is back down to the kind of whether the risk reward balance is right with FIDIC anyway, an unamended, unamended FIDIC starts with a fitness for purpose obligation on the contractor. Um, obviously, uh, there'll be a split in the room, no doubt, depending which side you're on. But from a contractor's point of view, that's, that's difficult to accept in terms of, of being a, a proper market position. So, you, you know, you need to look at that. And I also just touched briefly there on, on the dangers of, as it were, getting to fitness for purpose by another route. So you'll often find um, that FIDIC will try to impose quite swinging obligations on the contractor to check that the design that they've been given is, is fit for the, the, you know, the, the, the works that are about to be carried out. So again, it's sort of fitness for purpose by, by the back door. And then the whole MT Hogard and Eon piece about um, it may well be that you're only under a reasonable skill and purpose obligation, but because somewhere in the, the depths of your specification, you've signed up to a 20 year design life warranty, you're, you're actually as a contractor required to achieve effectively to achieve fitness for purpose. So, and those are the sorts of um, issues and challenges that come out when you're faced with a kind of 200 page FIDIC contract to, to, to grind through you know, you end up signing up to some of these things without really quite understanding that that's what you've signed up to. The engineer with a capital E. Um, again, a, a perfectly normal concept for those who deal with FIDIC, um, but it presents some real challenges, I think, in terms of having a party who is uh, often, if not always, an employee of the employer, um, and yet that person has to act um, on occasion with their employer's hat on, um, but also very importantly as this sort of mythical um, independent and unbiased party, the capital E engineer. And, and you know, and for any human being that would be rather a difficult acrobatics to, to perform, I think. So um, there is a potential conflict there. Um, how, how does one deal with that? Quite tricky, but that's certainly a, a, an issue, a challenge that FIDIC puts on the table for parties and, and, and you know all, all about how you how you deliver the project well you know if you're if, if someone is sort of laboring under this conflict of loyalties how do they get get through that to the right decision quite tricky potentially um, I mentioned uh, again earlier the kind of risk reward balance one of the starting points of FIDIC is that as we as many of you will know it has very dramatic um, obligations, very strict obligations in relation to notifications and time bar. Uh, so in, in essence, if you don't, if a, as a contractor, you don't notify within um, a particular period of time, an unamended FIDIC, it's 28 days, then you, um, you lose your right to claim. Um, you'll often see that, or you will sometimes see that being amended to say it's not a complete time bar, it's only if the employer is prejudiced um, in terms of that delay but 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 starting from the unamended FIDIC it's a complete time bar which you know in circumstances where you're working offshore you know we saw the video earlier we know how complex these projects are that that's quite um, that's quite tough um, and uh, we were again talking earlier about people who've come from the from the oil and gas side of things as many of us have you know that this concept of the amount of active change management that you need on an offshore wind project compared to the way that um, oil and gas projects now function. And that may be for different reasons. It's partly because of the contracts. It's partly because of the relationships, because people know each other very well. You know, there's lots of reasons to it, but, but it's, it's a real shock coming into offshore wind and understanding how much actual change management is, is needed. And a lot of that is driven by the requirements of FIDIC. 
So the way forward, um, Ian has talked about the, the FIDIC offshore wind contract, so he's already touched on this point, but yet 2025 is what they're saying. It'd be interesting to know if there's anyone in the room who's actually on the task force, but perhaps someone will put their hand up later if, if they are. Ah, excellent, okay. Um, so that will be good to know. But yes, I think having that, I, I, lo I really like the picture of the kind of the six bodies in the wheel. I think it's really important that we all we all liaise together. We don't end up with a panoply of different contracts going in different directions. Um, the, the point about agreeing principles first, uh, again, I, I really like the sense of having not just a contract, but having a set of renewables principles. And it's something that, that we as a business are finding helpful to be able to say before we delve into the 200 page FIDIC document and cover it in red, red ink, can we agree on those headline principles first as to what we're trying to achieve? And I think, to be fair, the IMCA renewables principles have been a real sort of help in kind of driving that, that approach. So a um, new way of looking at risk sharing, a new, new and, and fresh way of, of, of looking at, at, uh, at the way to, to deliver offshore wind projects, I think, is, is helpful and, and welcome. Um, and I think that was all I was going to say. So hopefully, hopefully that sort of set the background in terms of the FIDIC approach so far. Thank you.